Hi everybody, it's Katina. And, oh, I'm gonna scooch back so, a little bit so my whole head is in the video. Um, and I can move this a little bit too, so we're all here. So this is a better start. Hi, and I am going to mute this. So I actually have two screens going at the same time. That way I can see if you guys have any comments or questions that you've put over in the chat bar. Other than that, I'm gonna jump right in and today I'm going to talk about embouchure. And what I like to do when I teach and when I run the Clarinet Academy at George Mason is crowdsource the information because most of us, um, well, all of us, we all have techniques that we use and if we all bring them together, then we even have more knowledge between us together as a group. So, hi Tyler. All right, here we go. So, embouchure wise, we talk about this all the time because it's really important to have a good embouchure when we're playing so that we're not pinching the reed or we're too flabby. And that really impacts our sound and it impacts our intonation. These are really, really important parts of clarinet playing. So, one of the things that we talk about a lot is having these firm corners. So you want the corner, corners, the corners, the corners firm against your bottom teeth right here. So nice and firm there, but you can have a little bit of give in your lip. You can have a little bit of cushion there. And then you want this firmness right here along the side of your embouchure and that pointy chin. So this is a very hard concept to explain to students. And so what I usually try and do is go through this list of analogies until we finally hit one that works for that person. So one of the things I talk about, it's like that evil villain in the, uh, the movie that goes like this with their goatee. It's like they're pulling their goatee to a point. Or a witch's chin, that's another one that we talk about. Um, for people that can shave, which so far I haven't had that, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll talk to you again when I'm in my 60s. Anyway, um, that feeling, I, from what I understand of shaving, you want a, a nice firm chin here. Um, anybody that shaves, please chime in and help me out because you don't want anything squishy there because you can nick it. Um, another one I give as an example, which will fail nine times out of 10, is to think about putting on chapstick. Bizarrely, when I bring this one up, people show me how they put chapstick on. It's like really, like their lip is all over the place and I'm one of those people that keeps it very, very firm. So that's another one that I'll do. Lipstick or chapstick is a way that you can do it. So I'm gonna come a little closer so that you can see, but you want this lip firm, the chin down, and what you wanna do is practice it without the clarinet at first. So I just use the barrel and the mouthpiece and you get you set your good embouchure like this. One of the other ways that I talk about it is to say you, like your French, you, you want the you feeling. Um, another one is to have a sour lemon, like, ugh, right? That'll definitely get you right there. And then the last one, if you are not lactose intolerant, you can go to um, your favorite place and get a milkshake and use the, the regular straw, not the big milkshake straw, but a regular straw and try and drink your milkshake and you'll really feel those muscles working right there. Um, yeah, um, Tyler's saying that, that he uses the, um, the chapstick example. And that's my favorite one, but a lot of people, I'm not kidding, it's like they do this and I'm, it's amazing. Anyway, so we have set our good embouchure right here and then you wanna take your mouthpiece and at this angle here, bring it up to your top teeth and play. And then I double check to make sure they're sealing right in there. I'm one of these people that has a really tight B flat embouchure. So I have to work on it a lot to make sure that I don't seal it or I don't make my top lip too firm, firm because then I have that leaking that you'll hear it in some of my videos and I'm working on it. And I've been working on that for a long time. So that's one of my downfalls. It also can look like I'm doing double lip. And it's just the way my bottom lip is thinner than my top lip. And that's why it looks like that. So that's how I teach embouchure. I highly recommend using a mirror for this. Um, there are these great um, locker mirrors that I got at the dollar store and I just slapped on the back of a metal stand or the front, you know, the front of the metal stand. And then you can look at it while you play um, the, the phone, you know, flip it over and use the camera on the phone can also show you. Also, 
it can show you if you record yourself, you can go back and look at it a lot easier than trying to look at it from the side. So I'll have my students record themselves as well. Once you um, get this going, and if you have somebody to play along with, I believe it's an F sharp. So you can also try and match that pitch and that'll help you too. Um, especially that helps with not biting. Let me see what Joshua wrote. Is it bad to have double lip embouchure? I've played it most of my playing career and I found it to be a lot more comfortable and effective than single lip. No way. I think uh, double lip is a fantastic embouchure to have for clarinet. Um, it's, it's what they use for oboe and bassoon. Um, I think David Schifrin, the great clarinetist, he uses double lip. There are many clarinets that use double lip. It gives you a darker sound. Um, for me, I feel like when I play double lip, I don't have as much control as I like. So I like that feeling of having my teeth on the mouthpiece patch that, that makes me feel a little bit better. But I played for a couple of years with double lip, but it does darken up your sound. Another thing with double lip that I've used is when I get a student that really bites and um, if you're a biter or if you've worked with somebody that's a biter, it's, it can be really difficult to help that person to stop biting. And one of the reasons why it's so bad is it really makes your pitch skyrocket and it exhausts, it, it's exhausting. It's hard to play that way and they can really hurt themselves actually. I mean, I've seen kids with these deep lines in their bottom lip. I'll have them play double lip because um, then they're pushing their top teeth against their, their upper lip and it really hurts. So that helps people stop using um, the, um, the biting when they play. And sometimes they just end up staying with double lip because they like it so much. So double lip is one of the ones that I recommend too, if that's what works for you. Yeah. Um, could it be the reed or mouthpiece that causes you to open open G and clarinet to sound stuffy? Maybe an embouchure issue. Um, lately, my open G, especially my B flat, have been um, oddly stuffy. Okay, Tyler. Um, so if your G is all of a sudden stuffy, I want you ah to double check, and I'm going to bring my clarinet over so you can all see it. So um, double check your tone holes. If you guys watched the video I put up recently about cleaning your clarinet because of coronavirus, um, I talk a little bit about gunk getting in the tone holes. So, and that happens to all of us. So it's dead skin, it's dirt, it's maybe spit and things from the inside like Lynn, it's a little gross. Check your tone holes, make sure you don't have any stuff in there. Um, check your A and your, your A flat key right in here. Just um, And if you're not comfortable taking that off, let me know and I'll do a video on how to take that off and check those tone holes. And then, um, so you know, check your clarinet. I'm gonna save the worst case scenario for the end. Um, check, you know, try a different read. Um, Try your, um, double check your mouthpiece. Your mouthpiece might need to be cleaned out too so you can swab out your mouthpiece. Um, so try the reed, try the mouthpiece. And now I'm gonna talk about two worst case scenario situations. One is that your clarinet has cracked. So if you have a wooden clarinet, you're gonna need to check the tone holes. Check all along here for cracking. And I only know this one sadly from personal experience. My clarinet cracked once and it cracked right down through here. Um, and um, then it had another crack right over here. And that's how I noticed my clarinet. It was standing, it was really stuffy in my um, open G. And that's how I found out. And it was a huge bummer. And then from experience, I had another one where I actually couldn't play at all. And what had happened was I had dropped my mouthpiece off a stand. It was one of those crappy stands. Have you ever had the ones where you put your music on it and it flips forward because it's loose in the back? Those are like the worst stands in the universe. So it, um, it was one of those and my mouthpiece fell off. And when I picked up my mouthpiece, it looked fine. It wasn't broken or anything, but when I tried to play, nothing would happen. And then when I took the reed off, it turned out I had just broken the top of the mouthpiece, cracked it right through, but that mouthpiece patch was holding it on. So when I was trying to play, the reed was pressing against the mouthpiece, which was broken, so that was pressing against the reed and I couldn't play. So double check your equipment there first to see what it is, and then we can talk more about um, embouchure too. Um, so um, is, are there any tips you can give for helping with leaking air? <laughs> um, Clayton, I don't know if you were here earlier when I was talking about the air leaking for me. <laughs> Um, yeah, and it's super annoying and it's a real bummer when you're recording yourself because you can really hear it and it, oh, it drives me crazy. Um, so, okay. Um, and when I hear other clarinet players do it too, it, 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 I find it distracting. So let's talk about the leaking of the air and that is definitely embouchure related. 
Um, I'm gonna put my clarinet together just so that I can play for you. Um, let me see. Okay, so one, first of all, and I'll, I'm gonna just raise my stand a little bit if I can here so that we can see each other better. Um, so one of the things with um, that leaking is support. So you need to support here, push out with your abdominal muscles so you really can get that air moving through the clarinet, okay? Now, it's the side of my embouchure where my leak comes from. So go ahead and when you're playing, I'm resting my clarinet on my knees right now. So I can feel the spots where the leaks are. So go ahead and see if you can find it. And then try and adjust your embouchure for there. So as I was saying earlier, my embouchure is pretty tight up here. So I actually will try and lift up my bottom lip so I have a little more, to, a little bit more of the flesh going around the side of the mouthpiece so that I can seal it better. You can also try putting a little bit more mouthpiece in your mouth. One of the ways I've seen the leaks starting with students is they don't have enough mouthpiece in, they just have that little bit, right? And then you really leak, so try putting more mouthpiece in your mouth. And another one, this is the one my teacher David Krakauer told me, is to rotate your instrument until you can find that spot where the leak happens and then go the other way with rotating it until there isn't a leak anymore. And that's one of the ways that you can find that spot that's giving you trouble. All right, let me see if there's any more questions. Um, all right, yeah, Tyler, look it over and let me know. Now, if we're gonna talk about embouchure though with the G sounding stuffy, it could, usually it's a read for me, you know? But um, I try and pull my chin down and firm up my corners and sort of round out this aperture right in here so that I can actually have just a little bit more, if I were to do this kind of, uh, you know, this little shape right there. It's not, it's not an oval because it is sort of pointed at the ends of the oval, but that's what we want for our embouchure. Um, sometimes if I'm using a lot of air, I can feel that leak too. So that's one of the ways I look for it so that I can um, fix that. Any other questions, embouchure wise? Yes, yes, no? I see um, any tips for learning slap tonguing. Oh my gosh. Um, I actually don't use slap tonguing, it's to, uh, slap tonguing very much. And um, especially on B flat, every now and then it comes up on bass clarinet. Um, and that's, I have to use the whole back of my tongue, really. So my bass clarinet tonguing is a lot different than my B-flat clarinet tonguing. I would see if Michael Lowenstern has one of those videos. He does ear spasm music. If you haven't checked out his channel, it's absolutely amazing. Go see if he has any slap tonguing videos um, because he would definitely do a good job teaching that one. But that one I don't really do very much, so I don't have any expertise in that. Um, but that's a good one. Since I am, you know, social social isolating right now, maybe I'll go and learn how to do slap tonguing too. Um, Clayton, but if you find a good one, will you comment? I'm gonna leave this video up. The bass clarinet one I did didn't, oh, that one didn't stay up. But if you want to comment on this one later with a link, if you find a good one um, and share it with us, I would really appreciate it. And I think other people would too. So thank you for asking that question. Um, I have an upcoming piece with slap tonguing on contrabass. Yes. Okay. So thank you for saying that. Another channel to check out is Jason Alder. Um, he's got an excellent contrabass channel and there's another guy, there's another one too. Um, and I can't remember his name, but, um, if you Google contrabass or you put that in the YouTube search, I'm sure you'll find him. He's got an ensemble and he's got, I, I think he specifically has a slap tonguing video, but Jason Alder is very respon responsive to people. So if you find his station at, or his YouTube channel and write to him, he will respond if he doesn't have a video already. So I'm bumping you over to those two experts there, but I bet your piece is gonna be really, really cool. Um, awesome. Any other questions? These were good questions. I'm sorry I couldn't answer the slap tonguing one, but there are a lot of other great resources out there. Um, I was wondering what I could do for my embouchure to help my altissimo notes out. Oh, that's a good one. Um, 
let me try something. So I pretty much keep my same embouchure all the way through. Um, when I'm doing the altissimo, I actually pull my chin down further, but I push my t the back of my tongue up more in an E, in an even more exaggerated E position. And the reason why I think I personally drop my jaw is my tendency is to bite those high notes out. So maybe that's why I do it. Oh, there was a leak. Did you hear that too? The other thing I do to help the altissimos, I really support much more. So the higher I go, the more support I'm putting in there, which means I'm really spinning that air. It takes a lot of um, power to play those notes nicely. And the other thing that really, really helps with the altissimo is practicing those as long tones and practicing them for beautiful sound and control. And it takes a lot of time to practice altissimo notes up that way. And one of it's a you know public service announcement for us to play with the most beautiful sound that we can get, especially because we're all probably sequestered, not sequestered, but isolated with our families right now. And why, why would we do this to them? But practicing altissimo, do it nice and slowly. Make sure you do it with a pet nearby and take a video of it so that you can go viral with your dog howling along next to you. Um, but to, to, to summarize it, I make sure my corners are really firm. I pull my chin down more. I put my tongue up higher in an E, e position in the back and I support like crazy. I'm even talking about it and supporting more just because it's one of the things that I know instinctively I have to do. Even when I hear other people play and I am not playing, I start supporting <laughs> because it's just so ingrained in me to keep that support grow going. But play those long tones, lots of support, sound pretty, use a mirror. All right. Um, somebody says, can you see me? But I cannot. Um, I don't know how we can do that. <laughs> um, oh, can you see my question? Oh, there we go. You know what? I might have missed it. Let me see. Um, all right. So Tyler, yeah, just keep just don't bite those bad boys. All right. Art lover. I missed your question. Can you type it again? Um, Joshua, I got your double lip one, so that's good. We covered that one. Tyler, the reed or the mouthpiece that causes the open G. Yeah, check that out on a technical level first. Try some different reeds, see if that helps. Oh, and the bad news is, did you hear this? The reed companies, depending on where they are, had to shut down reed production. So I know D'Addario has two factories. Um, well, at least the one in California had to shut down because the governor of California shut down non-essential businesses. And then I think they had one in New York that shut down too. So that's, yeah, go get your reads now before we can't get them anymore. Um, slap telling, I'm sorry I couldn't help you. Um, be sure for high notes. Okay, any tips for running notes that changes your embouchure a lot? Oh, that was a good one. Um, I, I thought um, I thought it said ruining notes that change your embouchure a lot. Running notes. I think you all know what I'm going to say, um, but um, if you don't, you will be hearing it a lot. You have to play them slowly. Um, and I definitely put my time in when I was a music student in college of just sitting in front of one of those great mirrors that go on the back of a closet door because all of our practice rooms had those mirrors in it and just sitting there and playing very, very slowly and looking at my hand position and watching my embouchure. And even if it's just playing two notes at a time, <laughs> Especially for me, I need to go back to that. I had to take almost a year off from playing because I had cancer last year and I was fighting that and I'm all better now, but I couldn't really play because I had abdominal surgery. And so now I have to go back to these, um, to getting that leak on and getting my embouchure and my strength back and all those things. And the embouchure with the running notes is a thing for me because I'm just not strong right now. So it'll collapse and you get that, what they call strawberry chin. So long tones, playing long tones and slowly will help you. Um, one of the best ones really is scales. And since we have to learn scales anyway, this is a great time to practice our scales for our district band auditions, practice our minor scales, practice our arpeggios. But before I turned on the camera for this um, live stream, I was doing my thirds. <laughs> And I had an extra note in there, so I'd have to do that again. So I'm, 
I, what I, because I can't focus on many things at one time, I would just do it for five minutes. I would put a timer on and be like, all right, I'm just going to think about my embouchure for five minutes. And then the next day, six minutes or seven minutes. Um, with me, since I have to build my embouchure strength back up, um, I just do it until my embouchure gets tired. And this is really, really important when we're all working on embouchure practice. These are muscles and there are so many muscles in here. If you guys remind me, I can put, um, a share a PDF of, um, a picture, like a coloring page of what the muscles look like. I can put it on Instagram or I can add it to the YouTube channel, but, um, there are a ton of muscles in here and they get tired. And the best thing you can do is honor that. So as soon as you're leaking, as soon as it starts to quiver or you're tired, just stop playing. It's okay. Take a break. Go do something else. Um, you can do the fish face like this, kind of, you know, rub your cheeks. But the most important thing is since you're building these muscles back up to take the break. Yeah. So the running notes, take your time, play them slowly, play long tones without doing the running notes. You can even use the running notes as your long term warm up. So when I'm working with students and myself and I have a really hard lick, that becomes my warm up. And I do that very slowly so that I can get my fingers to land with a lot of safety and security, but it also helps build these muscles here too. Um, that was a great question. I think we all struggle with that one. All right, let me see the different other, oh my gosh, there's more ones. Okay, uh, what is the difference between a filled and unfilled reed? That, I don't know, I've never heard of that before. Are we talking about reeds that are like cane reeds and um, synthetic reeds? So if you can fill in that question a little bit more, um, then I will know how to answer that. Um, Tyler, you're looking into new mouthpieces lately, and I was confused on what the difference is between open and closed mouthpieces are. Oh my God, <laughs> so am I. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> it is a very hard thing for me to admit because I feel like all the other professional clarinetists can know it, and I do not. And I, they tell me all the time, and they're always like, oh, this one's more open and this one's more closed. And then I just, it's like, it goes right over my head. So mouthpiece wise, um, really, I go for the mouthpiece that works the best for me, but you might want to have a starting point of what um, more open and more closed is. And I really wish I could answer this question. I'm definitely showing my, uh, my weaknesses in this uh, live stream. So I believe there's a difference with open and closed with how the reed lies on it and the, heart, the strength of reeds that you use. Um, I think the more open mouthpieces are preferred by the jazz and the klezmer players. Um, so I you can't really do this right now, but I usually go to a clarinet day or a clarinet event and I go to the different tables and I just sit down and play. So here's my proposal and let me know what you think. I can interview Rucha Trivedi from D'Addario and she can explain the open and closed mouthpieces to us. So Tyler, if you want that video, let me know and I will set that up with Rucha. She's amazing and she explains it really well and she explains it to me at least twice a year and I forget every single time. So if I can get her on a recording to explain it, then um, then we won't have to worry about asking me. So I'm really sorry. Um, yeah, I'm just one of those people that plays and if it works for me and it makes my playing life easier, then that's, that's what I use. I'm not much of an equipment person. You'll see me changing ligatures a lot, and that's just because people keep sending to them to me, so I've just been trying the ones to find the ones I like the best. Um, you bought a Rico, and it says unfilled, but some other ones say filled. I have no idea what that is. Um, I will look into that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Sorry, I can't answer that one. Do you use circular breathing? My tutor asked me to um, train it. Any tips? Okay, this is one of the videos that I want to make. Um, and um, it's it's really not that hard to learn circular breathing. So I will make a circular breathing video. Um, but beforehand, um, uh, Michael Lowenstern also has a good one. So uh, go to Ear Spasm Music and he has a good one on how to, and he'll tell you the way that I would too, which is you can use a glass of water and you can also use a straw. But when I've done it in clinics, we just use the water. So here's it in the rundown. You take a drink of water and you put it in your mouth and you squish, the, you squirt it out with your cheeks. So you, you know how you squirt water out with your cheeks? 
So do that a couple times till you feel comfortable. And then while you're squirting the water out with your cheeks, breathe in through your nose. So you're pushing the water with your cheeks and breathing in through your nose, okay? So that's how you get that circle momentum. And then without the water, you're blowing the air out with your cheeks. So you're pushing it out with your cheeks and breathing in through your nose at the same time. And then you take your clarinet I actually, if any of you have a bass clarinet, it's easier for me to use bass clarinet for this one. Go ahead and use a nice light reed too. So if you have a lighter reed in there, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, I do it on open G. And what you're doing is you're pushing the air out while you're breathing in. Like that. And um, I'm gonna just do a caveat with that lighter reed. The lighter reed is easier for me as long as I'm not biting. So sometimes when you push the air out, it's easy to bite, so just be careful. And you can also pick a different note, so you have more security, like the E. And you don't want a lot of air in your lungs when you do it either, so you get your air in your cheeks. And you push it out with your cheeks and breathe in through your nose. So we usually teach it by starting with water because you get that feeling of pushing out. Once you can get a couple rounds of that going, then try and do it while you're moving your fingers. And then once you get that feeling comfortable, then try and do it without that sound. Did you hear that dip in the pitch when I did it? So you don't want that because it's ugly. So then try and get that out of there. David Krakauer is also another great circular breather. Um, and Robert Spring does it. There are a lot of people that do it. David Sampadin does it. And they do it so well, you can't tell. Ricardo Morales does it beautifully. And he uses it in Mozart and things like that. And Weber, so that he can play these really long, beautiful phrases without being interrupted by breathing. Um, I'll throw a pitch in there for my husband, too. He's a trumpet player. And he does it constantly. And um, you can't even tell. So when you get it ref um, refined, it really, really sounds good. And it's a great technique to have. Um, okay. Let me see what else we've got because I have to start wrapping up. I've got three minutes left, so I might have to save some of these for next time. Um, oh, the read thing. I don't know. I'm going to look it up. I'll look up the read thing, and then I'll write it in the comments or um, of this video that I, you know, what I found out. Um, or just come back to the next one. We'll do this every Friday, so just come back to the next one, and I'll talk about the filled reads. Um the video a uh, video with um Rucha would be good okay oh no she's great and we can just do a zoom one since we're all stuck at home <laughs> um okay my band teachers have given me some tips but do you have any tips for staying in tune oh my gosh i just made a video about that i haven't released it yet um i did a whole video on playing in tune um, so I'm going to release that video. I have to edit it and then I can release it maybe this weekend. Um, but playing in tune for me was an enormous challenge. It was very, very difficult to do. Um, and actually, um, the video I have is just the techniques of tuning, but I don't have a video about, um, actual, and this is my notes that I have to write. Um, let me do it on this one instead. Um, but how to practice playing in tune, that, that, that I'm happy to share with you um, because that was hard one knowledge for me. It was very hard for me to play in tune. And the biggest thing that helped me was blend. Instead of going, am I sharp? Am I flat? Because my poor brain was just exploding over that, as you could tell. I mean, I can't, you know, some of the questions I can't even answer here. So um, it was just blending. I'm just going to get inside that person's sound. I'm just going to try and sound like that person. And then from there, I would try and figure out which way I was adjusting. There is this CD, um, and now I believe it's on iTunes. It's called the... Um, uh, it's this tuning app. It's the Richard. It's by Richard Schwartz, and I'll I'll see if I can find it. Put a link in the comments for this for the tuning app. Um, but you can also do it on your tuner. So if you have the Tonal Energy tuner or any tuner where you can sound the pitches, use that and sound. Just practice it at home so you can put it on concert B flat, and then just try and play a C to see if you can blend and be in tune with it and what's nice about using your tuner app is you can turn that off and then you can look at that little needle to see if you're in tune i would suggest starting with everything lower than b natural so don't go over the break yet work on everything lower first and try and blend that and get that in tune you also really know the tendencies of your clarinet by the time you're done because you'll know which ones are sharp and which ones tend to be flat and things like that too but i would start over here i'll make a longer video very specifically about playing in tune so 
to summarize this, because I'm talking too much, just work on blending. Use a tuner that can sound the pitches and just try and match a pitch. And then what's really cool about the tuner is that you can do maybe the first and the third of a chord and then try and match that first, you know, try and play within that chord. And then when you get comfortable in playing and matching within a chord structure, go back to just the sounding pitch. And then you can, let's say we're doing on C, then just try and play open G in tune, right? And then try and play F in tune. And there's a whole series of notes that you can use by Hindemith, if you know that composer, where it, it starts out really, really open. So it's an octave, then it's a fifth, then it's a fourth. And then it just compresses all the way down into the end until you get to the tritone and it's even more dissonant. But I will absolutely make a specific video for how to practice playing in tune, as opposed to actually just playing in tune, which I made and I can release this weekend. But that was a great question. All right, um, yeah, let's wait, save our questions for next Friday. I'll write down the ones that I missed and I can start with those. But thank you so much everybody for coming. I hope you guys are doing okay and staying safe and healthy and all your family and all your friends and all your loved ones are safe and healthy too. And we're all doing the good work of staying home to keep everybody safe and healthy and we can just practice more, play more duets. Bye.